you this evening. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about Social Security Explained. My name is Mark Lang, and I'm going to be your host tonight. But before we get started, I typically like to let people know uh, when we do these live, and we haven't done them live for quite some time, uh, usually we schedule 45 minutes, but we usually run somewhere in the neighborhood of an hour and a half. Um, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask me the questions. Uh, I've reached the golden age of post 60. So my memory is not quite as good as it used to be. So if you have a question, write it down and ask me. Don't wait 20 minutes and forget it. Um, I'd rather answer the question. So feel free to do that or pop it into the chat box. I know Karen's going to pay attention to that. So let's get started. And uh, let me pop in. I want to thank you all for joining me. Um, my objective this evening is to give you a great deal of information, somewhat like a fire hose. I want to give you as much information as I can. Hopefully, you'll digest a fair amount of it. And if you have questions, ask as we go along. My partner and I decided to join SOFA about four years ago. My partner, Brian Cody, is a former nuclear engineer, used to teach the CFP program at Fairleigh Dickinson for quite a number of years. Brian's been in the industry for a little over 30 years. This is my 44th year. Um, yes, that's how I got to this point. And um, I thoroughly enjoy giving back. And this is one of the greatest ways that I do it. Uh, as one of the commitments that we have to SOFA is we give everyone who participates in our events the opportunity to sit down with us for an hour consultation. There's no obligation. It's free to you. I encourage people to take advantage of it just to make sure that you're on the right track. So what is SOFA's objective? Well, it's a 501c3, it's a nonprofit started in 1993. And really the mission statement's at the bottom to end financial illiteracy across the country, literally one community at a time. So let's get started. I want you to remember, this is an education only. I am not here to sell anything at all. Um, there may be specific tools that I use as an example as we go through this, but it's strictly for example purposes, not so much tonight, but in other, uh, presentations that we do. Normally, we'd have an evaluation form, but we don't have those since we've been doing most everything via Zoom. So let's get started. Let's talk about some of the key questions that people typically ask about Social Security. When can I take Social Security? If I take it early, does it go up when I hit my full retirement age? How do I maximize the benefits for my spouse? Will this impact other investment assets that I have? Is my Social Security taxable? And how does it work? So these are all common questions that we get from people with regards to Social Security. So let's start with what is Social Security? Well, the Social Security Act started in 1935, and it was established as a social insurance to prevent poverty. There's a board of trustees, and they have to provide us with an update as to how the trust is doing each year. And it requires that annual trustee report to Congress on the status of funds. Who makes up that board of trustees? Well, it's the Secretary of the Treasury, Labor, Health and Human Services, and the Commissioner of Social Security, as well as two public representatives appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. So as you can see, there's quite a few people on that board. What is OASDI? This is the technical term for what Social Security is. It's called Old Age Survivor and Disability Insurance, okay, OASDI. And you can see in this little round circle, I've got two things that are in yellow. One is retirement benefits and the other is survivor's benefits and two in white, disability benefits and lump sum death benefits. Why did I put them in yellow and white? because most people are gonna be most concerned about the two pieces in yellow, not so much about the pieces in white. And as you can see, a lump sum debt benefit today of $255 really isn't gonna go very far. So not a whole lot of people <coughs> are paying attention to that. So how is social security financed? Well, it's financed through what we call FICA, the Federal Insurance Contributions Act. So wage earners and their employers make mandatory contributions from earnings up to an annual maximum or cap. The cap for 2021 is 142,800. Self-employed individuals, however, pay, pay both the employee and the employer shares, but they get to deduct the employer's share from the taxable income. 
Beneficiaries with higher incomes pay income taxes on a portion of their benefits and a portion of the tax goes to the Social Security Trust Fund and a portion goes to the Medicare Hospital Insurance Fund. So important to understand how it works. How many beneficiaries receive Social Security? Now, these numbers are a little old. They go back to 2018 because they really haven't updated them a whole lot since then. But as you can see, almost 68 million people receive some form of benefits from the Social Security Administration. Okay, and you can see the numbers as we slide on down. 5.6 million people were newly awarded Social Security benefits in 2018. Today, we're seeing between 10 and 11 thousand people applying for Social Security every single day. Why? Because the baby boomers, which was the largest demographic in our society for a long time until, quite frankly, the Gen Xers have come along, we are now deeply ensconced in the baby boomers applying for Social Security. My, I'm 1959, technically the last date for the baby boomers considered 1962. So another four years after that was the end of the quote unquote baby boomer generation. Well, I won't hit my full retirement age, which is almost 67, for another five years. And so those people won't hit it for another nine years. So we have quite a number of years, almost another decade, that we'll, we will see maximum enrollment into the Social Security uh, retirement funds, those people starting to take Social Security. What's the biggest element I want you to understand from that? People will be getting more Social Security than they ever paid in before. Why? Because longevity, one of the biggest elements that we face with regards to retirement planning, is continuing to be on the rise. That last designation that you saw uh, underneath my name, RICP, is Retirement Income Certified Planner. The two biggest elements that we see people facing today is longevity and increased healthcare costs. So very important to pay attention to those two key elements because they're rising much faster than the cost of inflation. So Who's eligible for retirement benefits? Well, you have to earn 40 credits over your lifetime. How easy is it to achieve that? For each quarter that you earn $1,470 of qualified income, you earn a credit. So if you have four quarters of that or earn $5,880, you'll have four credits, multiply that times 10 years, and boom you've qualified for Social Security. The question then becomes, what will, what will the amount that you receive be? And that will be predicated on the, on the age that you decide to retire. And we'll get into that in just a few minutes. So what is FRA? And some of these acronyms we'll use moving forward because it's just easier to reference them, but it's what's called the full retirement age. And it's different for everybody. A full retirement age, though, is the age that an individual first becomes eligible for full, unreduced benefits. And it depends on the year of your birth. So the full retirement age for those born in 1960 or later is age 67. For me, I was born in 1959, so I'm 66 and 10 months. Don't ask me why they cut it off by two months for each year, sub, each year before that, but that's the way it is. If you were born in 1958, it'd be 66 and eight months. If you were born in 57, it'd be 66 and six months. The way I look at it is there was a bunch of people in that back room making decisions, probably with a lot of cocktails in their hands when they decided to do that, because I have no idea what the logic was as to how they come up with that. But you can apply for reduced benefits as early as age 62. So let's take a look at exactly how this works. If you were born between 1943 and 1954, your full retirement age would be age 66. And you can see 
50, if you're born in 1955, 56, 57, 58, 59, on down until 1960 and later, age 67. You can apply for Social Security up to four months prior to your desired start date. So always remember that because it's not an easy application process in some instances with Social Security. Sometimes it can be a bit of a pain in the neck with them, depending upon the individuals that you get to assist you. So what are your Social Security benefit amounts and how are they determined? Well, benefit amounts are known as what we call primary insurance amounts or what we call PIAs. So when individuals initially become eligible for Social Security or disability benefits, the amount received is normally the sum of, and you can see this is the current formula, 90% of the first $996 of average monthly earnings. Then you would get 32% of the average monthly earnings between $996 up to 6,002, and then 15% of any average monthly earnings over $6,002. So typically people will say, well, can you give me or show me an illustration of how this works? Well, I chose 1959, I'm age 62 today in 2021. So let's say that I've been contributing the maximum social security earnings every year since age 22. That means that my AIME or average indexed monthly earnings is $11,000. So we take that primary insurance amount formula and start to calculate it out. So $996 times 90% gives us $896.40. Then the difference between the $996 and $602, as you can see, $6,002 minus $996, gives us $5,006. And we're going to get 32% of that, which gives us $160.92. And then we add $5,096, which is the difference between my average index monthly earnings amount of $11,098 and that last tier of 6,002, so $5,096, we only get 15% of that, which is $764.40. So our total monthly maximum amount is $3,262.70 or 39,152 annually. Sounds like a pretty sizable number, doesn't it? It's not, it's not. In fact, the three highest states with regards to Social Security income, two of them are in the metropolitan area. So I would posture the question to just about anybody out there. How many of your patrons do you think could live on $39,000 of income? Be a little bit difficult in this area. So one of the biggest issues for many people when it comes to retirement, if they have not planned ahead, what happens to them? They wind up having to make decisions about their finances and their well-being and what they'll do be able to do in retirement based upon what the amount of money that they have available to them so this is just one of the pieces in that equation so many times people will say to me well gee mark what happens if i decide to take my social security early before my full retirement age in this particular illustration we're going to use 67 down in the bottom left hand corner as the full retirement age, meaning you would get full benefits, no reduction. You get 100% of your benefits. If your spouse also attained their full retirement age, they could apply and get 50% of your benefit. But you can see if you take those benefits early, there's a permanent reduction in the amount that you will receive versus your full retirement amount. So if you decided to retire and take your social security at age 62 and your full retirement age was 67, you would only get 70% of that benefit. And if your spouse did the same, they'd only get 32.5% of that benefit. So very important to factor these into your decisions with regards to social security. So what if you apply for early benefits? I show you 66 and 67, just to kind of give you a different, an idea as to the difference in those calculations. As you can see, if you take it early at age 62, 
and your FRA was 67, you get 70%. If your FRA was 66, you get 75%. So we can run through any of these numbers with anyone who has a question. As I say to everyone who participates, you're entitled to a consultation with us an hour, it's free. I encourage you to take advantage of it if you have questions in this area. Why? This is probably the area that most people have the greatest amount of questions and also have the most amount of myths that drive their thought processes. Well, my friend said, oh, I can't tell you how many times I get that my friend said. Well, I love the fact that your friend wants to be helpful, but they have to know what they're talking about or else you're going to get some bad information. So here's why I talk about that number. This is why 57% of all Social Security recipients take their benefits before reaching full retirement age. Why do you think that is? Well, we found that there's two primary reasons. Number one, most people, when I say, what's the retirement age that you'd like to retire? What do people say? Age 65. Why? because that was the original full retirement age for social security. So it's an anchor point component that we've become very comfortable with. But when do most people take it? Well, you can see at age 62, why? Two primary reasons people take social security early, they don't have enough finances to carry them through or poor health. Those are really the two issues. What we're seeing now is we're beginning to see the claiming strategies, however, getting stretched to the lower end of that scale. Why? Because of the enhanced credits that you can receive for Social Security, and they're substantial. So let's move forward and see exactly what happens. For those of you who were born in 1943 or later, if you decide to not take your benefits at your full retirement age, you can accumulate an additional 8% per year in added benefits for each year that you delay your application for benefits beyond your full retirement age. So if you had a full retirement age of 66, you have 67, 68, 69, and 70. That's a 32% increase in your Social Security benefits from the beginning if you wait till age 70 and you will get a cost of living adjustment on those enhanced benefits all the way through the rest of your life. The other thing that's beneficial is when one spouse passes, the remaining spouse will have the option of choosing the higher of the two benefits that they're currently receiving. But as I said, the higher of the two. You're only going to get one of the two. This is why it's so important for the higher wage earners, if they have the capability to defer taking Social Security till age 70 to enhance those benefits, not just for themselves, but for the remaining spouse. One little caveat down the bottom, Applications for Medicare are still recommended at age 65. If you don't apply and you're not covered by an insurance program, you can have a 10% surcharge added to your Medicare premiums for every year that you don't apply. So if you wait four years until you reach age 70, you could have a 40% increase in the premiums of your Medicare, and it will continue for the rest of your life. So very important to pay attention to those two components. As you can see, I'll show you the chart here of what happens in terms of enhancing your benefits should you decide to wait until age 70. And you can see if your FRA was age 66 and you waited till 70, get 132% of your full retirement age benefit. So almost a third more by waiting what? Just four years, just four years. Critically important for most people to be looking at that because in many instances, one of the biggest things that we're concerned about as retirement planners today, how much of your retirement dollars 
are guaranteed. Social Security for most people is the only option they will see in the future. Why? Because we don't see pension plans like we used to see. Almost everyone has 401ks, 403bs, 457s. Those are defined contribution plans, not defined benefit plans. So there's no guarantee as to what you're going to receive. But what all of you will notice as a result of the SECURE Act at the end of 2019, now, if you look at your 401k or your 403b statement, at least once a year, they must give you a projection of your anticipated income from that portfolio. And for many of you, you're in for a very rude awakening based upon the distribution parameters that are attached to that today. We, we have a question here. Sure. that we might, So um, her late husband received disability social security. Can she claim on his plan then at 70, claim her higher social security? The disability component is different than the retirement component. So retirement components are where you can gather the accrued benefits. The disability benefits, it's my understanding, pay out as a, as a guaranteed element for the remainder of that life expectancy and then passes on to the, um, to, to the spousal beneficiary. But it doesn't give you the ability to then enhance your credits on your side. You could enhance your credits on your side by simply deferring from whatever your full retirement age is. Let's say it was 66 or 67 and waiting till age 70. And you'd still be able to, to receive your personal benefits based upon your work history. So hopefully that answers the question for her. So one of the key questions though that people ask me is how much will these benefits provide to me into the future? And so I say to people, if you're getting, if you're entitled to a $3,000 monthly benefit today and you live for 10 more years, you'll receive four, a little over $400,000 of benefits in lifetime benefits. If you live 20 more years, you'll receive almost 930,000. And if you live 30 more years, 1.6 million. Assumes a 2.6% annual cost of living adjustment but as you can see, for most people, Social Security is just an incredible guaranteed income source that you have to make good decisions about. If you don't, you're basically frittering dollars away that doesn't make any sense. And they're, God knows they're hard enough to earn today uh, in the environment that we're in. So please pay attention to the optionality. If you're not sure which way works out best for you, um, you can reach out to me. My email will be at the end of the presentation. I'd be more than happy to run you through a social security calculation. We've got a couple of different pieces of software that really help people to kind of get a, uh, it really galvanizes their retirement picture and gives them an idea. Well, what if I went at, for example, 66 versus waiting to age 70, how much of a de decrease or increase in benefit would I have? Would it be beneficial for one spouse to take the spousal benefit if it's possible? So a lot of those scenarios we can play out so that it helps you to make those decisions as opposed to taking, uh, well, I think this is the best way, but I'm not really sure. So we can help you to do that. Okay. This is always a question that I get. Will Social Security be there for me? Well, technically, the OASDI trust fund is still growing. That's what they tell us. In fact, in 2019, they added an additional $2 billion to the trust fund. It's now up to $2.896 trillion. Uh, I look at it this way. The federal government can put out any kind of numbers that it likes. Uh, I don't know how much longer we will continue to see Social Security at the benefit levels that we see. And there's a reason for that. And the primary reason for that is the next slide. This was the long-term projection without any reform to the benefits that Social Security provides. The expectation was that benefits will fall to 79% in 2034. Why? There will be many, many more people receiving social security benefits, and they will do so for much longer periods of time. And additionally, there's far less workers supporting each social security recipient. For example, 
When Social Security first started, there were 35 workers for every recipient. Today, we're down to approximately two workers for each recipient, and that number continues to decrease annually. So we'll have to see what these elements are as we move further along, although I have to admit, there's a great deal of discussion in this area of not only pushing out the full retirement age, but also making Social Security a needs-based component. What does that mean? I will not be surprised if in the near future they push full retirement age out to age 70. And if you earn a certain amount or above, you will have your Social Security scaled down. That's in almost every single proposal that I see coming across the board. Uh, otherwise, I think you're going to see a fairly significant drop in benefits, obviously a 20% drop in benefits for anyone who's depending upon that as, as their fixed income is going to find that to be a fairly significant hardship. But it's something that you need to be aware of. This is the historical piece that I had one of my interns pull up just this past year. And you can see that the elements are still playing themselves out just like they were before. Um, except for the fact that the slopes are beginning to get closer and closer. So uh, we can get into a mathematical discussion, but that's not the objective tonight. So for most of you, you would probably say to me, okay, now you've told me a bit about it. How do I find out what my social security benefits are? Well, the easiest way to do that, since they don't just automatically mail the statements out anymore, is you go to www.ssa.gov. And you'll need to set up an account and you have to prove who you are. And you can see I put that in capital letters. What does that mean? You will be asked questions, some of which you may not have a good memory of from years that have passed. If you can't confirm the information and you only get two tries, you will have to go to the Social Security office to then set up your account. How do I know this? That's right because I flunked twice. They asked me, I had a car loan when I was 19 years old and they put four banks up. Three of them I can remember having a car loan with. Couldn't remember which year, but I screwed up twice. And then I had to go sit in the social security office for almost three hours to finally have them establish my account so I could then go online and be able to pull up my information. Very important to do that for two reasons. You want to confirm your work history in terms of the earnings that are showing up under your social security profile. Why do you want to do that? I had a client who went in and checked it and found that there were five years of social security earnings missing. Well, that's pretty substantive. So you want to make sure that all of your social security earnings are posted properly to your account. So please, I beg of you, go and do this well in advance so you have an idea of what your benefits would be if you took them early, if you took them at your full retirement age, or if you deferred them until age 70. Very important. Here's some facts, because I always get these questions, so I want to start out with these facts right off the bat. The primary worker must have filed for benefits for a spouse to apply for a spousal benefit. Let me say this again. The primary worker must have filed for benefits for a spouse to apply for a spousal benefit. In the old days, it didn't work that way. For example, let's say we had a husband and wife. Wife was three years older decided she's reached her full retirement age, wants to take the spousal benefit based upon her husband's work history because she may have stayed home raising children, didn't have as much of a work history. You can't do that anymore. If the primary worker didn't file for their benefits, the spouse cannot apply for a spousal benefit. They can apply for their own, but they can't apply for a spousal benefit. I get questions on this every time I do these presentations. And people tell me I'm wrong that it can be done this way. And I go, I'm telling you, this is how it works. All of those loopholes have been eliminated. If you are entitled to a spousal benefit, 
and your own benefit, you're deemed to be filing for both. So it's a combination of not only what you earned, but if the spousal benefit is higher than that, you would have the spousal differential added as the spousal benefit. So you'd have your primary and then the spousal piece on top, okay? Spouses must be at least age 62 for reduced benefits or 66 for full benefits. If there's a disability, they can apply at age 60. Only those who were age 62 in 2015 can use the grandfathered restricted applications. So for most of those people though, if they haven't already applied for social security benefits, they can look and see whether or not those restricted application components are available to them. Why? Because if you were 62 in 2015, how old would you be today? Okay, you'd be 68. So that would tend to, to indicate to me that you were probably looking to enhance your benefits by waiting till age 70. So you'd have to go through the grandfathered restricted elements to see if they're applicable to you. No delayed credits on spousal benefits after age 66, meaning once you've reached your full retirement age, we don't enhance the spousal benefits. And then the file and suspend loophole, which is one of those lovely grandfathered elements, was closed in 2016. So the file and suspend loophole is no longer available. These are usually the areas that people have the most questions because when you go back to the old strategies that we used to use, many of these things were mix and match and see which worked out best for you. Well, because of the fact that the Social Security Administration recognized that there's far more people that are going to come onto the social security roles in the future, they've started to eliminate all of those loopholes so that they wouldn't have all these dollars headed out. So very important to pay attention to those pieces. Quick note on Medicare. Many who take early benefits forget to apply for Medicare because they aren't reminded that this benefit doesn't start till age 65. So if you're delaying your social security until age 70, don't forget to apply to Medicare when you reach age 65. And if you're still working and you have health insurance through your company, there are waivers that you still want to go through to make sure that you've applied properly. If you do defer your Social Security and you, and you do have company insurance, as I say before, um, you, you don't have to automatically enroll, but you have to make them aware of the fact that you have that. And then lastly, if you apply for Social Security after turning age 65 and your seven month Medicare enrollment window is closed, you'll be entitled to enroll in the general enrollment, which is uh, January the 1st uh, uh, through the 31st of the following year. However, benefits won't begin until July and they can add a 10% penalty to the Part B premium for each year you fail to sign up. I tell people to pay attention to this because they generally haven't been uh, real, really penile in this area, but I am beginning to hear that this is one of the areas where they're going, no, we're starting to apply these penalties now because people are just not paying attention and it's another way for them to bring in additional revenue. So, excuse me, but could you then maybe, a good idea would be to just uh, Google Calendar, mark to go apply on that date. So in whatever, for me, five years, I remember to do it. But when should you set that up? A month before you turn 65? Three months. Set it up. You can, you can actually apply three months before your 61st birth, birthday, and you have four months afterwards. So that's your seven-month window. So yeah, I encourage people to start the process three months ahead of time. This way, you make sure that you sign up for it. But yeah, it's, it's one of those elements where it's your personal responsibility to handle these issues. And unfortunately, a lot of people just don't pay attention to it. So another question is, who's eligible for survivor benefits? Well, as you can see, dependents of deceased workers may be eligible for survivor benefits. The number of required credits depends on the age of the worker at death. However, no more than 40 credits are required. And if the deceased worker was employed for one and a half years during the three prior years, 
to his or her death, survivors of very young workers may be eligible for benefits. So as you can see, the Social Security Administration just gives you the simplest of equations to determine whether or not you can apply for Social Security benefits. It's not easy. There's 122 different ways that you can apply for Social Security benefits depending upon your status, whether it be benefits for children, whether it be benefits for family members, whether it be for disability. So there's so many different tentacles to get into Social Security, which were never the original intentions, but they have expanded many, many times through the years. So very important to understand that. What are the rules for spousal benefits? Because I always get asked these questions too. In order for a spousal benefit to be paid out, the other spouse must have filed for their benefits. The spouse must be at least 62 for reduced benefits or full retirement age for full benefits. No delayed credits on spousal benefits after full retirement age. And spousal benefit is based on the worker's primary insurance amount, not the actual benefits. And marriage requirement is only one year. Now, here's an interesting factoid. If someone was married for at least 10 years, they're entitled to what? Spousal benefits. Does anybody remember a fellow by the name of Johnny Carson? Yeah, Johnny Carson had three wives. And guess what? Each time he was married for at least 10 years. So now all three of Johnny Carson's former wives are getting full Social Security benefits based upon Johnny's primary earnings. Interesting, isn't it? So there's one of the spousal benefits that many people just are not aware of. How do we calculate it? Spousal benefits are one half of the primary worker's primary insurance amount if they started at full retirement age. So in this instance, we're going to show you John's primary insurance amount is 2000 Jane's is 800 If Jane applies at her full retirement age, her benefit would be what? One half of the $2,000 that John, that's John's primary insurance amount, okay? She would get 800 based upon hers and she would get 200 of spousal benefits. But if the spouse applies before full retirement age, your spousal benefits going to be reduced. So as you can see here, if we got you out to age 66 and that was your full retirement age, you'd get 50%, but if you were born in 1960, where your full retirement age was 67, your benefit's now 45.8%. And take it all the way back to age 62. If your FRA or full retirement age was 66, you'd get 35%. And if your full retirement age was 67, you get 32.5%. So very important for people to pay attention to these um, uh, percentages because they carry throughout life, the remaining life expectancy. They don't bounce up. So in other words, if you take your benefits prior to your full retirement age, they don't automatically bounce up to what your full retirement age amount would be. No, you get that reduced amount for the remainder of your life expectancy as long as you're collecting. You'll get your Social Security cost of living adjustment, but it's going to be on the reduced benefit. So it's always important to pay attention to that. And I, I want people to remember that. Rules for survivor benefits, couples must have been married at least nine months at the date of death. Not uncommon for seniors to get remarried late in life today. Why? Because many seniors recognize that the ability to access Social Security, especially for those who become dear companions late in life, is a very common element. I see it happen quite a bit. And I also see what happened. I see one widow and one widower and they don't want to get married why because they don't want to see a reduced benefit so they they maintain their higher benefits by staying uh, individual at that point survivors must be at least age 60 for reduced benefits 50 if disabled or full retirement age for their full benefit survivor benefits not available if the widow or widower remarries before age 60 unless the marriage ends. So that's why you see so many people not doing that. They cohabitate. And divorce spouse survival benefits are available if the marriage lasts at least 10 years. I call it the Johnny Carson factor, but that's how it works, folks. So how much will you get? Well, survivor benefits are going to depend on one, 
the age at which the deceased spouse originally claimed their benefit, what we call the original benefit. If they claimed it before their full retirement age, the survivor benefit is going to be limited to the higher of the deceased spouse benefit or 82.5% of his PIA. That is a floor that they put in. How did they come up with it? Haven't got a clue. If he claimed his benefit at full retirement age, the survivor benefit will include the delayed credits. So if he delayed until age 70, the survivor is going to get what? not just the full retirement amount, but also the delayed credits that got added to it. Second, the age at which the widow claims the survivor benefit, or what we call the actual benefit. If, in this instance, she claims before her full retirement age, her survivor benefit will be a fraction of the original benefit. Okay, If she claims at her full retirement age or later, her survivor benefit will be equal to 100% of the original benefit. So as you can see, very simple stuff. Um, it's, it's things that, look, you don't deal with this stuff on an ongoing basis. So you can see there's lots of nooks and crannies, for lack of a better description, with regards to how Social Security works. And as you can see, there's a lot of different pitfalls where people can make lots and lots of mistakes. So if you're unsure, feel free, reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to run you through the calculations so you can get a, a pretty good estimation of where you stand coming into retirement. If the spouse dies while both are receiving benefits, the widow or widower may, I should put, will switch to the higher benefit. I don't know of anybody who has decided to take the lower benefit. In all the years I've been doing this, I've never had a spouse say, no, I want to continue to keep my lower benefit rather than take the higher one. No, everybody takes the higher one. So let's go through an example. Joe and Julie, again, are married. Both are over their full retirement age. Joe's benefit is 2000. Julie's is 1200. Joe passes away. Julie notifies Social Security and her $1,200 benefit is replaced by her $2,000 survivor benefit. Again, she chooses the higher of the two benefits. This is what happens if we went to the early claiming strategy. As I said before, they were married. His primary insurance amount was 2000. He filed for social security though early at age 62. So his benefit got reduced to 75% of the 2000 or 1500. He passes away. Julie's survivor benefits gonna depend on when she claims it. If she claims her survivor benefit at 66 or later, which means her full retirement age, her benefits will be 82.5% of Joe's 2000 or 1650. This is a special floor for survivor benefits. But if she claims her survivor benefit at age 60, her benefits are going to be reduced down to 71.5%. So very important to pay attention. The amount that the survivor actually receives depends both on when the deceased spouse filed for their benefits, and when the surviving spouse files for their survivor benefits. So you can see there's a couple of different variables that get plugged into this equation. What are the survivor benefits if they delayed? Well, again, we'll use the same example. In this one, Joe files for Social Security at age 70. So his benefit is 132% of the 2000, or now 2640. He passed away. If Julie claims her survivor benefit at age 60, her benefit's going to be reduced. But if she waited to her full retirement age, look what happened. She got the full advantage of those delayed credits. She'd get the full benefit of 2640. So this is why I say Social Security is so important for married couples to think about the longevity element and the remaining spouse in many instances. Are non-working spouses eligible for surviving benefits? Well, of course they are. Of course they are. They didn't have to work. Many non-workers such as widowed individuals, unmarried children, dependent parents can qualify for survivor benefits. So very important to remember that. 
are non-workers eligible for survivor benefits? Well, widowed individuals are eligible for unreduced benefits at full retirement age. They can, reduce, they can get reduced benefits at 60 years of age and 50 if they are disabled. But as you can see, those benefits will be dropped dramatically. Widowed individuals supporting children younger than 16 years of age or disabled are eligible. Unmarried children younger than 18 years of age, 19 for full-time students are eligible. And if the deceased worker provided more than 50% of the support, workers' parents are eligible at 62 years of age. So as you can see, there's quite a few tentacles to this social security octopus, isn't there? There's lots and lots of different ways that it can be accessed. And that's why I say, if you've got a unique situation, reach out to us. We'll help you to walk you through it and determine what you're eligible for. Rules for divorce spouse benefits. More than one spouse can receive those benefits on the same worker's record, what I call the Johnny Carson factor. Benefits paid to one ex-spouse don't affect those paid to the worker or their current spouse or other ex-spouses. So if you had somebody that got married four times and was married for at least 10 years to each one of those spouses, you could have four individuals claiming off of that primary element as a spousal benefit, divorce spouse benefit. And divorce spouse benefits stop upon remarriage of a spouse who's collecting benefits, not upon the remarriage of the primary worker spouse, only on the person who's receiving the spousal benefit. So, uh, divorce spouse benefits are the same as spousal benefits. If the marriage lasted at least 10 years or more, the person receiving that divorce spouse benefit is currently unmarried. As I said before, this is why many people who still want a companionship as they get older don't get remarried so they can take advantage of those things. And the ex-spouse is at least age 62. And if the divorce was more than two years ago, the ex-spouse does not need to have filed for benefits. So you can see there's lots and lots of different stuff that, that, that gets plugged into this equation. Next is how much benefits are taxed. And it really depends upon your filing status. So whether it's individual, married filing jointly, or married filing separately. Now, the interesting part about married filing separately, for all intents and purposes, you can think of it as individual because it's very similar. So I'm going to walk you through one of those calculations as well. So if you're an individual and your combined income is between $25,000 and $34,000, up to 50% of your benefits are taxable. And if your combined income is more than $34,000, up to 85% of your benefits are taxable. So let me make this easy for those of you who are listening. If you're making $45,000, will you have to pay up to 85% of your benefits? Probably not. Why? What's the standard, de standard deduction and exemptions today? So really, it's once you get to about the 60K number as an individual, that 85% of your Social Security is going to be taxable. But as you can see, next to it is the joint. So from 32 to 44,000, up to 50% of benefits, and 40, above 44,000, 85% of benefits. So jointly, once you get to about 70K, 85% of your social security is going to be taxable. It's a nice round number. So what does that tell you? Anyone who lives in the New York metropolitan area, in all likelihood, if you have two people that have gotten to a point where they can max out their social security benefits, guess what? They're probably going to pay 80, they're going to pay taxes on 85% of their benefits in all likelihood. So very important to pay attention to those things. I'm not going to talk about provisional income tonight. We'll talk about that in the next uh, presentation that we do about sustainable income. And there we're going to get into the unique aspects of provisional income and how it applies to the taxation of social security benefits, also Medicare and the cost of those premiums, which are predicated on the income level that you bring in. So very important to pay attention to that. And there's only one element that will allow you to really avoid the provisional income calculation. And I will get into that the next time that we discuss this. So many people will say to me, I would like to continue to work and I would like to take my social security benefit. Well, what happens if you do that? Well, if your full retirement age is not reached during that entire year, they will deduct a dollar 
from your benefit payments for every $2 you earn above the annual limit, which by the way, is not very high. If you reach your full retirement age during that year, they'll deduct a dollar in benefits for every $3 that you earn, but only on the earnings before the month that your full retirement age is reached. And if it's the beginning of the month that your full retirement age is reached, then there's no limit on the earnings. There wouldn't be any reduction with regards to your social security benefit. So for those of you who plan on working in retirement, if you're going to work prior to your full retirement age, you in all likelihood will see a reduction in your social security benefit. It will accrue additional dollars so that when you get out there later, it will bump up your payments a bit. But I tell most people, if you plan on working prior to your, retire your full retirement age, don't take social security benefits, wait, wait. Key things to consider, only apply for one benefit at a time. Do not file for both simultaneously. I've had people do that and they go, oh, I thought I was doing this and suspending that. No, you need to pay attention to how you apply. In most instances, it pays to compare your own benefit against a survivor benefit to determine the strategy that will generate the most money long-term. And in most instances, it is beneficial to take the lower earning spouse's benefit first and defer the higher earner's benefit until age 70. This strategy locks in the biggest benefit for the surviving spouse. And lastly, here's a question. Can a Roth IRA impact how much my Social Security is taxed? Normally, I would ask this as a polling question. Yes or no? Anybody have any idea? Feel free to unmute and give me an answer. I must repeat, have scared everyone. Repeat the question. Repeat the question. Can a Roth IRA impact how my Social Security is taxed? No, the, the Roth will not have any impact on how much your social security is taxed. However, and this is something that you need to remember, for those of you who have tax-free bonds, and we'll get into this next time, tax-free bonds are a provisional income component. So although they may come tax-free to you, they could, spike the amount of income that you receive so that more of your social security is taxable. So important to pay attention to that. Conversely, you can have the largest distribution you like out of a Roth account, it won't have any impact on that provisional income calculation to determine, determine how much your social security is taxable. Even if you had $200,000 coming out of your Roth account, doesn't get flowed into the provisional income calculation. So remember that key item that I'll talk about in the next presentation because it's something that's applicable to many people in this area in terms of their planning for the future. So always, this is the question, when should I take Social Security? And as I always say, it's a personal decision that should be based on needs and probable life expectancy. Healthy individuals can typically delay benefits which will likely increase future benefits for a younger spouse. Less healthy individuals typically begin receiving benefits at age 62 or those who need the dollars. So very important to pay attention to those elements. The other thing that I tell people to pay attention to, because you know, real estate prices over the last year and a half or so have gone up fairly dramatically in the New York metropolitan area. Prior to that, for people who are living, for example, in Bergen County, I have a number of clients in Bergen County and Westchester County and Orange County. For many of those people, because of the uh, salt tax, the state and local taxes that were no longer uh, deductible, 
many of those homes were taking much, much longer to sell than they had in the past. So unfortunately, for many people, their largest asset was taking many years to become liquefied and usable towards retirement as people moved out of the area. So if that's something that's a concern for you or you're close to retirement now, I beg of you to please run the calculations and determine if those additional dollars from a hot market might be most beneficial to you today if you're planning on relocating someplace else. Very important to pay attention to that. Then lastly, when we talk about retirement planning, it usually always comes down to three choices in Social Security, whether to take it early, take it at full retirement age, or take it on a delayed basis. So I always like to just kind of pop through this very quickly. These are some of the different claiming actions that you can take. So as you can see on the first line going from left to right at age 62, if you decide to claim at age 62 and David's benefit was $1,500, and his spouse decided to take it at age 62, we would typically say, oh, okay, going to get $750 a month. I'll get half of that. Well, we can see that David's primary benefit was based upon a full retirement age of 66. So he would have gotten $2,000 a month on the next line, but he decided to take it early at age 62. So he gets what? 75%. And that means that his spouse's benefit is she also re, uh, took it early, would be reduced as well. If they both waited until full retirement age, he'd get his full 2000, the spouse's benefit would be a full 50%. And if he waited until age 70, he would get $2,600 a month. And in this instance, you would actually see the spousal benefit wind up being half of that as well. So that's one of the rare instances where it actually works out to your favor. So what I tell people, what are the next steps? Please get familiar with the Social Security statement. Go to ssa.gov and get your account set up. Understand how the primary insurance amount is impacted by either early or delayed retirement, any earned income that you have, and then taxation. Consider financial products such as annuities to help bridge the gap. Why do we talk about annuities today? Because a lot of the work that was done by Dr. Wade Fow and Dr. Moshe Malevsky has indicated to us that the greatest need for most people moving into retirement today is to increase the amount of guaranteed income that they have. For most people, the only guaranteed income that they'll have is Social Security, and very few people we'll look at the advantages of annuities from a long-term perspective. We've done a lot of that work from a mathematical standpoint. Dr. Moshe Malevsky has done an awful lot of work. I will begin to incorporate that into the subsequent presentations that I do. It's a little bit geeky in terms of mathematics, but for many people, they will begin to earn, learn how there's not only a reduction in risk in the portfolio, but a much higher probability that the guaranteed income will meet the income elements they expected based upon their projections. What do I mean by that? Well, as I said, this is my 44th year in this industry. If I go back to when I started in this industry and I looked at, for example, investment grade bond funds, back in that period of time, we could have looked at investment grade bond funds and gotten between five and a half and six and three quarters percent from an investment grade bond fund. Lower graded or junk bond funds, we used to be able to get anywhere from seven and a quarter up to double digits. I can't get 6% out of a low graded bond fund today, period. So the entire landscape and the expectations for income from those sources has changed dramatically. And for those of you who are closing in on retirement, if you haven't run the analysis to see how that impacts you, I beg of you to do that before you get to retirement. I tell people the best time to start planning for retirement is 15 years before you're ready to retire. But most people will wait till, you know, basically five years out and feel that that's a good number. I would prefer that they're doing it seven, eight years out because then you can change the trajectory of how things look or, and or in many instances impact how much social security you're gonna receive, especially if you had some gaps. 
Because Social Security is based upon the 35 highest years of your earnings history. So for those of you who have gaps and you can fill in some of those gaps, uh, now would be a good time to, to, to do so if you have that capability. So very important to, to work through those people, through those pieces. So I want to thank you all for jo joining me tonight. As I said uh, when I started, um, I was going to feed you this information primarily through a fire hose. So sorry about that. There's a lot of information to cover. I try to cover the highlights mostly, but at this point, I'm more than happy to open it up to any questions that you have. So feel free to unmute and ask away. I see lots of perplexed faces. <laughs> like I, I, like I, like I really did stuff an awful lot of stuff down your throat tonight, didn't I? It's okay. Don't feel bad. You can also type it in. Um, yeah, just feel just, free to do so in the chat. Just as a reminder, this is recording, and I think it records on speaker view. So if you speak, you will show up on the screen. So you can turn your camera off and ask your questions as well. If that is something you'd rather do. You're right. This was a lot of information. This is only the first step. So this is the foundational <laughs> element. Um, the next, the next step is how to create a sustainable income in retirement. And we're going to talk about some of those longevity concerns. We're going to talk a bit about the mathematics of risk management through retirement, which is a critical component for people because, for example, Married couple, age 65, what's the probability that one of the two of you makes it to mid-90s? Anybody have any idea? It's 50%. So basically, it's 50-50 that one of the two of you makes it to the mid-90s. So really, what do you have to plan for? 30 years of retirement. When I show people the impact of inflation at 3% for 30 years, most people fall off their chair. Well, that's a 3% inflation factor. Right now, the current inflation factor for this year looks like it will finish the year if it stays on pace currently, someplace around 9%. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the intriguing part of that. Consumer price index that the federal government uses to determine the increase in Social Security is based upon the CPI minus food and energy. Why? Because they're the two most volatile components. Well, here's the funny thing that I find out about that. I don't know anybody who can go without eating. And I don't know anyone who can go without energy to heat their home or run their vehicles to get to and fro work. So when they say, well, we're not going to plug that into the equation because it's too volatile. And I go, wait a minute. It's the one that affects people the most. Why would you get rid of it? So I'm sorry, folks, but when I see stupidity at the federal government level, I have to call it out. And this is one of those times that I call it out because it just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, can you go down to the pump and say, uh, last week it was two and a quarter for regular, it's 275 this week, I'm going to pay you two and a quarter. No, no, that's not how it works. These are real numbers that flow to people's pocketbooks. So I am hopeful that we won't continue to see this kind of an escalation in inflation because quite frankly, what you're gonna see, and everybody's talking about the windfall for social security this year, social security recipients are gonna see an increase of about 6% in their social security payments this year. What do you think that's gonna to do to the trust funds longevity longer term? I mean, let's play this out exponentially. And if you like, we can run the mathematics which is always fun for me. I like to do the geeky stuff because I love to show people what the impacts of this are. But I think all of you who are sitting there listening can go, oh my goodness, I can see what the impacts of this are going to be. So that's why it's so critical to step up and pay attention to these things and start to plan long in advance so that if there are things that you can do to change that trajectory, you do so. So unless we have any other questions, I want to say thank you so much for spending an hour of your evening listening to me bloviate about Social Security. I hope that it helped. If people have questions, um, normally I finish up 
with just my evaluation sheet. Let me see if we have it on the back. Yep, we do. My email's down the bottom there. It's mark.lang at lpl.com. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, just let me know that you saw one of the SOFA presentations and ask. let me know what your questions are. More than happy, no obligation to you. As I say, both my partner and I enjoy doing this. We recognize that it's a very confusing area for most people. And in many instances, we can walk you through these things so that you get a digestion of it and say, aha, at least I have an idea now what to do and start to formulate your game plans moving forward. So thanks so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. You're very welcome. And it's lpl.com, right? Correct. LarryPaulLarry.com. Okay, I'll have so to just, put the uh, big letters in the next time because even I can't see it that well. Yeah. So I just put that in the chat and I will try to send that out to people too. Super. Well. I see we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Let me just look and see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You guys are terrific. Thanks so much. Really appreciate your taking the time. And thank you, Mark. And to thank all you. the libraries. Thank you. And to Thanks, everyone for coming. Thank you, Deborah. See you. Super. We'll see you again shortly. We'll see you at the next one. You got it. Okay. Good night. Good night.